My name is Sarah Stansfeld. I'm a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist and I work in Manchester in an NHS community mental health team seeing 16 and 17 year olds who present with moderate to severe mental health problems. I've been asked to talk about pride and what it means to me. 2020 marks 50 years since the first pride celebrations and 51 years since the Stonewall riots. Pride is important to me as a celebration of how far we've come. It's something that I've personally benefited from in being able to get married, to start a family and to be accepted by those around me, both um, in my home life and also at work by my colleagues. Pride is also a protest. It's a way of unapologetically making our presence felt and a space to demand equal human rights. It's important to recognise how far we still have to travel particularly in reaching rights and freedoms for trans people. Working with teenagers, I've seen the excitement and anticipation of Pride Month and Pride celebrations. And these have a hugely important and positive effect for young people in being able to celebrate and explore their identity and also in being able to bolster the armour which is sadly still needed to be queer in the world. It's exciting to me to see smaller local Pride festivals developing in places that just never would have happened when I was a teenager. In Greater Manchester, there are now Pride festivals in Oldham, Bolton, Wigan, Stockport, Salford, among others. It feels like the message is spreading, that you don't need to move to the big city if you're LGBT+, you can be accepted wherever your home is in the UK. There's more to homophobia and transphobia than verbal and physical attacks. It's also about the shaming of people of any age, but especially children and young people who present in some way differently in their gender expression. This might be in their interests, it might be in their likes and dislikes, in the way they dress, in the way they speak, in the way they behave, in a million tiny little things that make up our natural everyday interactions with the world. The message that comes from those around the young person is that part of you is wrong and you must never show it and never speak of it. Take that part of you that makes you different and squash it down and make it so small that people can't see it anymore. Or otherwise face rejection, humiliation or assault. This message could be delivered by families, parents and carers, siblings. It could be in school by staff or by peers, it could be by health or social care staff, it could be by strangers, neighbours, um, anybody. People sometimes do this intentionally, but the gender norms in our society are so ingrained that oftentimes it's by people who feel like they're acting for the best, or they're protecting the child, or they don't even realise that they're doing it. This happens many, many times. Each incident can be small in itself, but massive when taken together. A recurring message. Don't be yourself. Don't be yourself. Don't be yourself. And this leaves a scar of sadness, of low self-worth, of powerlessness and shame. And it is this experience of homophobia and transphobia, which is a risk factor for developing mental disorders, including anxiety, depression, use, harmful use of substances, addictions, self-harm and suicide. Other aspects of identity, of course, are happening at the same time. Religion, social class, race, ethnicity. And these will impact both on the person's life experiences as an LGBT plus person, but also how easy it is for them to access mental health services. There's a lot that we can do as psychiatrists when LGBT plus people present to us seeking help with their mental distress. This includes providing a space to be listened to, to get an understanding of what they're feeling and how it fits in with their experiences. It includes providing high quality mental health care and access to therapies and interventions which are appropriate for them. That being said, we need to recognise that LGBT plus people are living in the world and have a great many life experiences and potential risk factors. We need to see them as a whole person and not attribute everything to their LGBT plus identity. 
Another important role we have is to advocate for young people in helping those around them to understand that it's okay for them to be who they are. In CAM services, this is often about working with schools and families and also about linking young people in with local LGBT plus youth groups where they might be able to meet young people of a similar age who are going through the same kinds of experiences and find a safer place to explore their identity. Mental health services have had an uncomfortable history when it comes to the treatment of LGBT plus people. Homosexuality and transsexualism were previously labelled as mental illnesses. Conversion therapies were offered to try to change people's sexual orientations. This was based on the assumption that being heterosexual was inherently better, rather than recognising and accepting the full diversity of gender identities and sexual orientations. It can be tempting to say that this past is behind us, but we need to recognise how this past shapes our present. Only five years ago, Stonewall carried out a survey of health and social care staff, which found that 10% of staff have witnessed colleagues within their workplace expressing the belief that someone can be cured of being lesbian, gay or bisexual. Problems come when we assume that those with no lived experience of LGBT plus situations can speak for and decide for those who have. We have a responsibility to ensure that LGBT plus people are involved in designing our services, in evaluating our services and in training our staff if we want to make services which are accessible, welcoming and feel safe for LGBT plus people. We must also be vigilant that we're not pathologising difference. Our job as mental health professionals is to support people to move on from distress and illness. We need to be careful that we're not contributing to the millions of tiny and not so tiny repressions that are faced by LGBT people. Negative attitudes do persist and we need to find a way to have compassionate discussions with colleagues if this does arise to help people move forward and to reduce the impact on service users. One way to mark Pride Month this year is to start having these conversations, either informally or in situations where services are being planned or being evaluated or staff training is being planned. This is a very different year when it comes to Pride, as we can't crowd together to celebrate because of the pandemic. However, I hope people will be able to come together, either with social distancing or virtually, and I hope that music will be able to bring us together Music's always been a part of Pride celebrations, so I hope that people can put on their favourite song, can wear something that makes them feel comfortable or happy or expressive and dance. For though we can't touch each other at the moment, we can dance. And so through music and dance, I hope that we can express our pride and our freedom. I'm happy to say that I'm proud to be a lesbian and I'm proud to be a psychiatrist.